with it, it with Superstar? Um, well, we both we both went to to Brown uh, University, and um, and you know Christine made films at Brown, and they were really interesting films, mm. and um, and I started to make I was making films at Brown as well, and we had a lot of the same friends, and we were kind of um, kind of checking each other out, <laughs> you know, with a little, like, mm, you're, you're interesting, with a little trepidation, I think. Um, and then a friend of ours, a mutual friend, invited us to take part in a, after we graduated, in a project he started in New York, um, a nonprofit organization that we called Apparatus Productions. And we, through a, some money from his family, we started this nonprofit group that was there to sort of start, and we got grants from the New York State Council for the Arts, and we, we, and we learned so much about just how to do that. And we were helping emerging filmmakers make experiment, experimental narrative films, as we called them. Filmmakers who were too new to really get grants from NISCA themselves right off the bat, and we were sort of there as an intermediary organization. And out of that, we we sort of developed practice and a relationship to the community that ultimately resulted in my first feature, Poison. But it was during that time that I made Superstar and she came to the editing room in my apartment and said, you know what, I want to produce your next movie. How'd she, that feel? And she did. It felt amazing because <laughs> I had such respect for her. And it also, but it was an interesting baton passing moment, I would say, because it also meant that she wasn't thinking of herself as a filmmaker anymore, but as a producer. She had changed sort of stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing Poison when I first moved to Paris. Mm. That was early 90s, right? Yeah, what right at the beginning of the 90s. It was, it was prob probably released there in 91, I think. Yeah, it, was, it had an amazing impact. I saw that first, and then I saw Superstar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then I saw everything else he ever did. Right. <laughs> it's not too many of them. Well, they've, they've been amazing. Thank and you. like um, Juliet Moore, yeah. is, what's your relationship with her? Because, well, in uh, Safe, that yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. I still remember that scene, like in the dry cleaners. Oh, yeah. With the nosebleed. It was, no, that was a hairdresser. Yeah, the hairdresser. You're yeah. good. God, yeah. I can't remember. Amazing. No, I, I, I love that film. I, yeah. I saw it, I don't know how many times. Oh, she. Yeah, I was just so lucky to find her at that moment, you know, and for that script, which was a, which was a experiment. That character was a such a sort of cipher. Um, that it was one of those extraordinary moments when she read it, uh, when she came into audition, and she read that character, and all of a sudden, there was flesh and blood behind the words on the page in ways that I had never. I don't know if I've ever had quite that experience before with an actor, you know, that just made it feel all, you know, viable in a way that you, you're you still in that kind of jelly m mode where nothing's fixed, you know, and it's scary to start fixing things because you're worried that they won't work, and all of a sudden such a central component was right staring me in the face. It was, it was a great moment. And how did the relationship develop into, like, Far From Heaven, working with her? I just had such a, you know, her, her performance in SAFE was so extraordinary. Her commitment to that project, the, the way we all really, you know, believed in it and had very little resources um, to realize it. Um, you know, it was a great experience, and I, and I wanted to work with her again, and I, and I had always loved and um, studied to some degree the great melodramas of Douglas Sirk and college and, you know, and, and, um, and the, the sort of Fassbinder re-evaluation of those, of those films and his own, uh, the way they influenced his work. Um, so I sort of felt like I, I got to get into that at some level in my work, in my career and address those themes a little even more directly than I had on, in SAFE. Um, and it was the first time I think I ever wrote a script 
with a specific actor in mind. I really wrote it for Julianne. Um, and this, actually, you know, I, I thought of her as having red hair. I thought of Kathy Whitaker as having red hair. And I drew this picture and put it up on my window before I started writing the script of Julianne as Kathy Whitaker with the red hair and the red autumn leaves, you know, behind her. And then when Julianne read it, she was like, I love it, I want to do it. And she was like, but Kathy should be blonde. <gasps> I was like, oh, okay. Because Julianne almost always played redheads. She would change her roles, her characters drastically, but she could pretty much maintained the red hair. Um, and so I was, I was honored that she actually went blonde for me. And how did you work on the color? Because that's like a major um, aspect of the film. Yeah. We, um, you know, paid very close attention to the ways in which Cirque applied color, used color, <clears throat> and actually varied color within his films, particularly All That Heaven Allows, which was sort of our, our, our template. Film. Who was that? Rock Hudson was in there. Rock right? Hudson, Jane Wyman. Right. Yeah. yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Amazing. And the palette is a really, it's a more subtle uh, uh, sort of um, um, complementary spectrum that almost every frame in All That Heaven Allows in, includes warm and cool colors to varying degrees of balance. And, you know, complicating the emotional themes in the story, in my mind, like making visible um, the sort of conflicts and range of issues that the story um, is telling. And so that was sort of an inspiration for us. Um, but it wasn't until I really collected these great collaborators, Mark Friedberg, the production designer, Ed Lockman, the director of photography, and Sandy Powell, the costume designer, that these ideas about color, <clears throat> which started with me in, intuitively and sort of instinctively and produced where those color s swatches, those color um, palettes that I created for various scenes in the movie, almost all the scenes in the movie, um, became materialized with specific players and participants and how to break those colors down and share that that process um, they were never meant as a sort of one-to-one -one coded um, like green means this and red means this you know I think it was more about interaction of color um, and definitely feeling the temperature the climate that various combinations of color would would um, provide and what was uh, your relationship with uh, Sandy, the costume designer? Like, what kind of, how did you work together to develop the characters? Uh, really fantastic relationship. Sandy did costume. I first worked with Sandy on Velvet Goldmine, mm. and that was a film that meant a great deal to both of us. Also, our age, our ages being almost the same, our and and Sandy being English, so she really was there and in. A, a young teenager exposed to the glam era, the glitter era, firsthand in ways I wasn't as an American. Um, but it meant such a such a close part of her development. She worked with um, Lindsay Kemp, who was the mime instructor to David Bowie, and then went right off and worked with Derek Jarman very early in her career as well, um, who was certainly influenced by this this chapter of of popular music. Um, so that was an amazing relationship that forged there. And, and Sandy's house, <clears throat> her, her Brixton apartment, became a kind of hanging out pad, a central uh, depot during the production of, of um, Velvet Goldmine. And um, she just opened up her whole life to it in a way that was so beyond the call of a costume designer. It was great. It was a really amazing relationship, and we wanted to work together again, and this was the, the next opportunity. Um, so it was great. It was wonderful to have her here in New York, um, and um, 
and it was tough because Julianne was pregnant. Howard and we movie. had to conceal it. And even Julianne's acting is this very interesting kabuki around midsection obfuscation. Um, that I have to rewatch. You have now. to rewatch. And actually, I shouldn't even say that because then once you no, notice it, you're like, oh my God, she really is like, yes, Raymond, you know, doing all these things. Um, but it's great because nobody noticed. Nobody it, noticed, so. and it was another kind of concealment or. Yeah, which works perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> level of armor or limitation in her body. And what's next for you? I'm doing a script. I'm finishing up a script with um, a writer, John Raymond, who lives in Portland, who's a friend of mine, who adapted Mildred Pierce with me, <laughs> and who wrote all of the, who worked with Kelly Reichert on her last three films, which I executive produced proudly. Meek's Cutoff, uh, that was the most recent. Um, Old Joy, Wendy and Lucy, and Meek's Cutoff. I, I Kelly Reichert I brought to the Pacific Northwest as a friend, and she made it her her um, subject matter in these three features that John wrote stories for and scripts for, too. Um, so he and I are working on a film that deals with contemporary, populist, conservative sentiment in America and the way, yeah. Good timing. Yeah, I know, exactly. Um, we're just really just getting to the point where we're just starting to show it around. It's still, we've been working on it mostly just this year. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so it won't be done in time for the election. I, you know, I want it to be something that really fairly accurately reflects a, a, a sector of the country and a, a, you know, and, a, and a sentiment that is ongoing and has continued to sort of thrive and you know, um, and and dovetail into Republican policies, but it taps something deeper in, in American, um, I don't know, thought about uh, resistance to to um, dominance, which is now all placed on this idea of government. You know, a sense of what's so interesting about so many of these people that we talked to when we went to Kansas is that these were the guys who were the Vietnam era generation. They voted for McGovern in 73. They protested against the Vietnam War. They were anti-government when it meant anti-Vietnam. And then throughout the 70s they shifted and almost didn't notice that it was a party change. That by 1980 they were still anti-government but they voted for Reagan. And so the same feelings of get off my back, don't tell me what to do, um, got shifted from one party affiliation to another. So it goes deeper than just party. There's something um, fascinating about that to me, you know, and more about the American character than necessarily about the right or the left. It's so kind of scary. It, it is scary and fascinating. And what's scary is how well one party has made use of it. Hmm. And do you have uh, the actors in mind? Not yet, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just still too early. So this is probably not going to come out for a couple years? Probably not until next year, I'm hoping. Oh, next year. Yeah, that would be great. And Christine is? Yeah. Of course. Yes, of course. That's great. Is she here tonight? She is. Chance? She's going to come tonight. Yeah, wow. she got back in town. God. Yeah, she was just at the Transylvania Film Festival. Transylvania. I was in Transylvania once. Where I, is it? In Cluj it's in, or something? It's in, I'm sorry? Is it in Cluj? It's in... It, is Cluj the town? It's Romania, but yeah. but where... Is that the town? Is that the town? I don't know. Uh, I th well, that's where I showed my little film festival was in Cluj oh, yeah. in Transylvania. Maybe. Well, it must be. It, it must be that. Also. Yeah, I don't know the area well enough. Oh, that's wild. That's what? really wild. Oh, am I not wearing them? <gasps> I'm wearing the wrong ones. Oh, Can I take a picture of yes. you? Yes. In your 